So we've heard a lot about um, some of the most pressing issues influencing development. Uh, so how about now we take some time to appreciate the two things that people and development are heavily relying upon worldwide right now. Hope you've guessed it right. Yes, the next session is about advanced science and advancing science and technology for development. And to enlighten us on the same, we have Professor K. Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor and former Director of the National Center for Biological Sciences. And to facilitate the fireside chat, we have uh, with us Nivriti Rai, Country Head, Intel India and Vice President, Data Platforms Group. Uh, her other notable work include championing the use of AI and machine learning to enhance uh, road safety in the country to agreements with state governments and collaborating with the Consulate General of Israel to drive innovation and connect startups from both the nations. Thank you for joining us, both of you. Over to you, Nibriti. Thank you very much, Pooja, for this uh, very generous and uh, very elaborate introduction. Uh, I view myself as a simple technologist uh, working very hard for India through Intel. So my honor to introduce to you the principal scientific advisor. Um, his accomplishments, if I start telling all of them, I'll perhaps use the entire half an hour. But here are some of the really notable ones that I would really like to share with everyone. Um, so Krishna Swami Vijay Raghavan, um, is our principal scientific advisor. He's the, the fellow of the Royal Society called as FRS. Besides that, he is a distinguished professor and advisor for the most premier research institute that we have in India, TIFR, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He's also a protein. Um, he is the key advisor for government of India and three primary things that he's driving, uh, building the scientific uh, policies, uh, the strategy required for any technology development or scientific work, as well as driving innovation for the country. I must tell you the three principal scientific advisors that India has had since 1999. The very first one, is the very eminent Dr. A.P. Three, uh, Dr. N. R. Chidambaram, whose research uh, in the nuclear physics are very notable. He uh, supported the Baba Atomic Center. And the third one, uh, the current one, is our very eminent um, Vijay Raghavan. So very honored to meet you, sir, again. And I must remind you, the very first week, April 3rd, I remember you were nominated as the principal scientific advisor. And that very same week, sir, I met you in Delhi. So it's my honor to talk. So um, I will start, you know, since I know you from uh, the very first week, I have this level of comfort. So when I was asked to facilitate this fire chat, I, saw, I thought nothing better than talking to, uh, you know, the one um, person that I respect so much. So sir, feel comfortable to stop me if you don't like the question. If you want to answer a question that you, you, know, you think is more relevant, please do so. So if I may, my very first question is that the Prime Minister has constituted a council uh, which is called uh, uh, you know, the Science, Technology and In Innovation Advisory Council. And you are the, uh, uh, the chair for this, uh, this council. My belief is that uh, you know, the goal or the vision is to comprehend challenges, uh, to look at uh, you know, for relating a specific interventions, roadmap, and advise the Prime Minister. So, so besides this advisory council, do do you believe leadership like mine and others would be valuable to you in building this futuristic technology roadmap? Uh, thank you very much, Navrati. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, and uh, I'm really uh, happy and grateful uh, to be here on this panel with all of uh, you over here. Um, now, uh, the Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation 
Advisory Council uh, has people from academia, industry, uh, social sector, who get together along with secretaries to major government departments linked with science to discuss the way ahead for major programs. Now remember that each uh, ministry, each department has its own programs. And of course the private sector and our academia have their own programs. So this is not a body which uh, tells people what to do, but looks at the ecosystem and plans what necessarily are the directions we can take. That advice then goes to the government, which implements it through its ministries. More recently, there's a new group which has been formed by cabinet. It's called the Empire Technology Group. And the purpose of that is to bring coordination in large budget efforts across ministries so that we are aware in terms of technology, what different ministries are developing, manufacturing, procuring, so that there can be coordination uh, in action, both in procurement, but also in policy and R&D. Fantastic. Um, so we are there with you, sir. Whenever you need any partnership, you know that uh, you know we work wonderfully together. Um, since you talk about R&D, uh, research and development in India has seen significant growth. Uh, we now are in the top five countries uh, globally contributing to uh, uh, you know, scientific papers. I know we have ways to compete in terms of uh, patterns. What are some of your thoughts in uh, trying to address some of the bottlenecks in attracting the best talent to our academia, to our, you know, our industries, to uh, the different uh, uh, participants are some of the bo uh, bottlenecks uh, that you see uh, that we could address together? Well, in terms of um, institutional development, what is needed to attract the best talent to an institute is culture. If the institute has a positive attitude in receiving people, welcoming them, and a, uh, an environment where people work together, then better and better people keep coming. So that results in a sort of institutional growth of quality. But that quality is not sufficient, uh, though it's necessary, uh, to deliver. One has to have a clarity on what the institutional goals are. Those goals are often set from outside. If you don't set those goals clearly, then that quality feeds back onto itself internally into navel gazing and becoming better and better at less and less with poor connect to the outside. So it is up to us as society, as industry, as government, to set institutional challenges so that institutions can respond and use their quality for larger purpose. That happens in some places. Very good, sir. So you're saying, you know, culture uh, can be a little bit modified, we need to show more, but uh, more being second up of technology when we looked at space and nuclear programs. You know, when we were looking at a lot, I contribute. But do you think that, uh, you know, this uh, uh, space and nuclear programs are sufficient or must focus on, on to drive growth? What are one, two, three areas that you think that we should do more, sir? Uh, um, thank you, everything. Um, you were, uh, the audio was breaking up, but you know, the nice thing about the English language is that it's about 50% redundant uh, and one can guess what the question is. So I'll quickly reframe the question. Um, you, you pointed out that we focus a lot in terms of R&D on space and nuclear programs. Uh, is that sufficient? Do we need to look at other programs too? 
And I think uh, that's absolutely right. We need to do those programs much better. And we also need to do other things well. Now, space recently, um, the cabinet has completely restructured the space interaction with industry. There's a new structure called In Space, which will work to attract industry projects to ISRO and allow that to, um, you know, that collaboration to grow the space program in big ways. And that's really path breaking. And ISRO has uh, taken uh, this leadership in this and is taking this forward. So you're going to see much more happening in space. Along those same lines, whether it is in agriculture, in health, for example, these are two very important areas, we will have to see similar restructuring. Again, I'd like to stress the internal capacity in our R&D is enormous. It's, so it's not a problem about the uh, precision of means which are there. It is the uh, very good um, uh, goal articulation which we need to bring these means into the goals. That's happened in space and atomic energy. Similar articulation of goals in other areas would be valuable. For example, if you had a clear goal, which the Prime Minister announced today, that in 100 cities, we're going to make them pollution free. Well, that's a good goal. Now, that puts all of us into action to formulate how we can form centers of excellence in, for example, um, Ahmedabad or Indore or Mumbai or Bangalore or Hyderabad and have these look at waste and pollution in every possible way and to sort that. So these articulation of goals will help us a lot. Thank you very much, Vijay. And I really apologize. My, I don't know, just today my internet connection has to go bad. I have some questions. Sorry. Good now. Oh, perfect, perfect. So I have some questions that the audience has, uh, you know, submitted uh, Vijay. Um, the very first question is, what are the science and innovation clusters and the role of government uh, where industry and academia can, can join and play in? Now, what are some of the clusters that you believe that, uh, you know, um, the rest industry and academia can join in in partnership? Um, thank you, Nirmati. I don't know uh, where our audience is distributed, but let's, for example, assume that some of them are in Delhi and in South Delhi. In South Delhi, if you start from Delhi University South Campus uh, and then go on to uh, JNU, IIT, All India Institute, uh, three major institutes of the Department of Biotechnology, the Nuclear Research Center, the Indian Statistical Institute, and a bunch of other institutes in the Kutub uh, institutional area. If these institutions were act to act as one, without compromising their autonomy. Do you have a Stanford or a Berkeley sitting right there? But they not only have challenges acting as one, within those institutions, the departments and individual researchers have challenges working together. So what is the kind of institutional enabling umbrella one can create, incentivize that, both by you know, giving what I'd like to say, um, some uh, incentives so that they are attracted to go and do things, but also some pressures that they are, you know, pushed to do those kinds of things. Um, and that is eminently feasible now. So we have had major discussions on this and starting off primarily at the beginning with uh, the Bangalore, uh, uh, Chennai region, Hyderabad, uh, Pune, Mumbai, uh, Delhi. Um, we uh, are we're getting these clusters in place where institutions will have an enabling functioning environment right up, right from their academic activities, right up to major missions which they take together. Uh, and this is something which um, is eminently feasible. Now, what happened after we formulated this, just afterwards, before we could get started, we had the, the pandemic start. That quite naturally, have brought people to work together and have a shared sense of purpose. Now that the challenge we have is to continue to have this shared sense of purpose with these institutions, with partnering with local, national and global industry to sort problems. And I think that's uh, eminently feasible. Thank you very much, Vijay. 
Uh, another question that I must ask is, again, coming from the audience is, what can India do to compete with other countries when it comes to social innovations? The second part of the question is, can you take specifically, talk specifically about the role of capital and talent required for this? And I know, uh, you know, uh, the, the countries may not be mentioned, but China, for example, you know, there's a lot of competition that people talk about from China and considering a lot of geopolitical issues, uh, what are some of the areas that you think India should stand up uh, in terms of social innovation? And I'm very excited. I'm asking you this because, you know, your contributions in biology, your contributions with TIF TIFR, talks a lot about what you are driving from health perspective and you know from AI what you and I have partnered with of course uh, Triple IT Hyderabad and few other uh, contributors and education so just wanted to hear uh, you know a little bit more elaborate on what are some of the social innovations India could step up and do. You know if you look at any of our important sectors health agriculture uh, you know, jobs, skills, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are two sort of uh, different peaks of viewpoints. One thinks that we can do anything, and the other thinks we can do nothing. Uh, and the reality is that this is a very complex world, and each of these topics require judicious, careful choice, and a combination of both tactics and strategy. In today's interconnected world, it's not possible to just be technologically good and scientifically good. You need to be able to do that in addition, be competitive globally. Now the pandemic has shown the dangers of having strong and few nodes in global supply chains. When they break, suddenly everything goes for a toss. And India and many countries responded well to that break in global supply chains and now we need to go ahead. When we need to go ahead, when we build up, so you know, the way I would like to put it is, the rope which is made, about, made up of politics, economics, science, technology, and people, which seemed so stable and strong till the end of last year, has become completely unraveled. Now we have to put that in place together, and we should therefore now put it together in a new way, which benefits people at large. How can we do that? And a short answer is whether it's a social sector or anywhere else, we must understand that the world has changed dramatically in the last decade, where there's an extraordinary value for ideas coupled with action. So design coupled with action and everything is very, very important. So the cyber physical becomes important, but also ideas in multiple kinds of areas of work. Therefore, India with its young demography, with a large number of young people, can exponentially grow when it anchors design at its, as its key role and exports that as an R&D rather than low-end R&D. And then connect that with the physical. Now, high-tech physical will take a little longer to develop. That requires major investment and bringing things together and a different kind of integration with supply chains. That's a, a linear uh, slope going upwards, but the idea revolution can be exponentially upwards. Lovely. I love the way you explained it, that, you know, focus on design, focus on R&D, uh, look at deployment, but then, you know, don't ignore the supply chain, manufacturing, all of that sector. And you're saying start gradually. You can't be, you know, driving up uh, the highest level of automation and robotics, but start small. Let's look at components and build, you know, manufacturing uh, out of India. And so do both. And in order to do both, I think what is really required, uh, Vijay, is a lot of policy regulatory requirement. And my own view, you know, considering I have partnered with you on a road accident avoidance, I've partnered, I'm partnering with you on AI for health and with CSIR and all. What I think would really be uh, nice is to have, uh, you know, a sandbox regulatory uh, approval for many of these uh, inventions, innovations, such that we can start with a POC and not have to worry for about a year or two years to get the regulatory support. But when we do mass scale deployment, then we, you know, look at all of these regulations. 
So do you believe this sandbox regulation and policy could be made available for people who are driving such innovations? Absolutely. And not only can it be made available, we have started, you know, de facto experimenting with that during this crisis. There are many speeded up regulatory requirements without compromising on quality, which we needed to do at this time. So, you know, what we thought um, always takes time can be done in a much shorter period, both by uh, these innovative uh, approaches, but also doing the routine much better. Um, we had earlier had the globally, we had a viewpoint that uh, regulation was like um, good wine, that it matures with age. Uh, and therefore, the longer the process takes, somehow the more valid it is. Now, that attitude uh, has certainly gone for a toss. And so without compromising on quality, ideas like sandboxes and so on uh, will actually be welcomed much more than before. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Um, the, another question, and you know, people are pouring out questions. So I'm like, you know, making sure I'm looking at the audience questions and uh, not just, you know, uh, continue asking what I want to. So the next question is, uh, and I'm going to start with a quote that I think I have definitely shared with you, is the growth of a country uh, comes from uh, entrepreneurs, comes from innovation and with the support of policymakers. This is, you know, a, a famous quote by a American economist called David Audrish. So the point is, uh, how do we encourage our startups? I know that we are third or fourth startup nations. Uh, we have, uh, you know, several uh, unicorns. The, the number of months or uh, years required for the unicorn is getting smaller. But how can the industry, uh, both local and global, help? How can, uh, you know, government contribute a little bit more? And uh, my thought was, this was an audience question. My thought is, uh, Vijay, a lot of companies like ours are driving a lot of CSR activities, you know, two to three percent of uh, their investment they are driving. Is it possible to leverage uh, all of that CSR budget and without, you know, asking for more, uh, drive uh, more of startup uh, kind of areas where the country will benefit from leveraging all of this uh, CSR money? as well as you know other contributions like the start the many of these companies have startup incubators what are your thoughts there how can we drive more how can we push more in terms of funding well there are at least um, three components which startups need to grow in a big way and the first certainly is is funding and last year what we did is we pushed uh, after lots of discussions to have the corporate social responsibility rules change so that now CSR funds can be used for supporting startups and incubators. So if there are startups associated with incubators, uh, associated with the central government or the state government, then they can get CSR funding. So that's really something very good. Um, that allows those resources to be used in multiple ways. So, but the second more fundamental issue which startups have is a bootstrapping. You know, are they serving, are they bringing value to industry? And is industry seeing value in them? And are they together seeing the growth of a satellite ecosystem surrounding that industry, which is really high quality startups? Now that's a combination of a infrastructure and a cultural prop, uh, issue, which are addressable. So surrounding big manufacturing hubs, you need to have a strong startup ecosystem linked to that, but also linked globally. That has happened in some places and that needs to go. But the third component, which is really critical, which needs to come about is a shakeup in our academic interaction. Our academic system has been the um, source of many of these startups. IIT Madras's you know, startup ecosystem is fantastic. You know, it was barely a shell a few years ago and now it's just bursting at the seams. IIT Delhi and IIT Bombay have followed and others are following too. But a strong characteristic of them, even though that's changing, is that these startups are taking on technologies which are self-evidently there and setting, it, setting them up in a frugal and innovative manner 
so that what costs say $30 abroad costs $3 here and you can be competent. And that's a great way to do things. But that's not the only way. In addition, our academic ecosystem today allows us to have startups compete internationally right away and do things which are really cutting edge. That daring comes when faculty members are more directly involved in more and more startups. That needs to happen. It's happening in our engineering institutions. It must happen a lot more in our research institutions. Thank you very much, Vijay. And I must tell you that uh, me as Intel is partnering with IIT Mumbai's um, startup effort. They have this uh, uh, group called Sign within uh, IIT Mumbai. And Intel, IIT Mumbai, and Department of Science and Technology are partnering for incubating many startups. I'm, I'm very proud that you know we are uh, we are doing good work there. Um, the next question is: Oftentimes, uh, these social challenges are very complex. And when you look at VC funding, the VC funding is going towards uh, you know pro problems that are not necessarily social. Yes, they are you know, uh, cutting edge technology like AI, you say AI and the startup gets funded. But uh, the question is, many of these social challenges are very complex. How do we get the VCs and the funding people to fund these complex social problems that help the, the humanity? And the second question is, it's similar. How do you get talented people to work towards these social uh, challenges? So, uh, you know, the attraction of people to come and work on social questions in a big way comes in two, uh, again, two iconic extremes. There are people who dedicate their lives uh, and, you know, do that. They're very inspirational. They're there at the grassroots. They raise resources and they show extraordinary proof of concept. Then there are others who have become extremely wealthy and fund NGOs and fund big programs and do that. Both of them are invaluable, there's no question about that. But we need to have a different situation, a different approach in addition, which has effectively crowdsources responsibility uh, and puts that responsibility in two more sectors, amongst our citizens, and therefore we should fund, even however little we can, we should fund um, big aims, big goals, big structures. All of Cancer Research UK, for example, is funded by crowdsource uh, distribution, and it's one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the world, and it funds cancer research. So the demand for solutions through research and innovation should come from people also, and people putting their money, even however minuscule, uh, they put their money there. Similarly, people should also make demands on their elected officials, municipal officials, city officials, state officials with the government to solve complex problems and work as partners uh, with them. If we don't have that connect with our political system as a demand in addition, then we will not have the ability to solve problems because that connect is absolutely essential. So things are changing a lot. You see a lot of really high quality NGOs, corporates coming in, citizens should come in a lot more and my feeling is a sense of pride in your city um, or your village or your uh, area of work will cause dramatic changes. Thank you very much, Vijay. Uh, I really loved talking to you, enjoyed your answers as usual. But one thing I want to tell the audience before I hand it over to Pooja, that uh, if you look at uh, you know Vijay, he is very, very approachable. Uh, for me, as Intel India head, he's helped. I try to reach out to people and I'm trying to see how I can create value and contributions. The one introduction that I wanted to say for the last, he's a wonderful human being. If you have an idea that you believe can you know, contribute and value, uh, create value for India, please reach out to him. He's a great support and a great partner for me. And I am sure he'll be a great support and great partner for for you besides helping you with all the policy regulatory stuff his intellect his uh, you know um, ability to connect is awesome thank you very much vijay and uh, you know continue shining 
and uh, taking India forward. So over to you, Pooja. Thank, thank you, everybody. That's excessively generous and a lot to live up to. But thank you very, very much for a wonderful evening. Likewise. Likewise, Vijay. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Thank a you. lot, sir. Yeah. Thank thanks a lot, sir. And thanks, uh, Ms. Rai, for this discussion. It was actually very, very engaging. Uh, actually, very exciting than actually um, that, that I imagine. Um, thank you for sharing for all the key insights on developments that are taking place in the field of science and technology in India. And also for sharing uh, some valuable suggestions on enhancing institutional um, workings for greater advancement. Thanks once again, uh, both of you, for joining us. Thank you.